Well, I hope uh, I'm going to start, get this started. Um, if it, you're in the right place, they changed up where I was giving this talk before. I was in Amethyst 2, I think. Now I'm over here. But installing OpenStack using uh, SaltStack. I'm part of the advanced technology group at HP that is also running um, PaaS Core, which is platform as a service. And I've been poking at Linux for quite some time and trying to replace what I do with all of these. I've tried them all, and so far, right now, this one's on my list to continue trying for a little longer. Um, I have people pushing me to try, oh, let's try Ansible, let's try this other thing, let's try another one. And Salt has won out for me at the moment on a lot of, a lot of things. It's simple, it stands up quickly, and I can get other people using it very fast. And so I'm working with a group of people now, about six people that have come in, and I've had them been able to stand up uh, OpenStack using the SALT uh, uh, formulae that I have internally at HP that I also have released publicly on GitHub, and I'll give you the URLs for that later. And you might be in here because you've tried OpenStack. You've used DevStack or the SALT, you know, you set up a SALT master. But installing OpenStack is a pain in the ass. And we know this. If you've gone from, <laughs> if, if you've gone from, you know, Essex to the, you know, Diablo and all this, oh, Jesus, and now Grizzly, oh, what have they changed? Oh, they've changed this in the pillar of this. Oh, God. Horrible nightmare. What Salt lets us do is get the configurations where we want them in our control and then just put it in the files, push it out. Salt still hasn't solved the problem. Salt does not solve the problem of upgrading OpenStack. OpenStack has to solve that themselves. That is not where I think Salt should be playing around, but Salt should be a big player and is becoming a little bigger player in at least orchestrating some things behind scene. Uh, people are using heat for orchestration of one layer, but they're using the last part of actually configuring the machines are like Chef and Salt. And you're probably, you know, this is the jokey one. Other rooms are full and you're here because there's a power outlet somewhere. Uh, I wrote these somewhere else. I would have known. Uh, things change. We have all these configuration files. Which ones do you care about? Do you care about them all? Do you care about just a few? Um, are you locking down your configuration so the server is pulling in from the minion, going, hey, I need this and I expect this all the time? Or are you in an environment where you can push out and say, I expect a change and I'm pushing it out to people? And those are two different ways and Salt lets you do either or. For our development world, we can, we can have it always pulling. And up, oh, it's crashed. Okay, now we can monitor and get alerts and figure out why. On the production world, might be better off to push. Only make the change when we have to. Maybe have certain ones, key files that we want to monitor. You can have it as a pull. But we're not doing like high state across everything because I really don't like just running it willy nilly. And if I have too many people in a group that can actually commit code and if we're using the GitFS backend, oh no, they pushed into the wrong branch, and that goes live. That's something that I'm trying to see if we can get changes into the GitFS to actually take potentially like SHA-1s. I want to be able to pull based on a SHA-1 for this instead of a branch, but it stays a name of an environment. Uh, it's also looking past your current infrastructure. What do you have, what do you have right now? What are you gonna have in 10 years, five years, one year, six months? Building out a salt structure that has naming things that you expect. Uh, as you start with a top LS file, and when I was starting with uh, salt, the, there was not the include for the pillars. And you really had to just know exactly what you want or maybe 
express all the pillars out that you had for individual environments. And that's one of the things that I learned how to, to get around with, with not keeping so many repositories. I really only have like two, major, two, three major repositories. I have my base and I have my state, my states that I use for the environments. And then I have my pillars. And, but I have multiple environments and I can expand my multiple environments. And the reason that I can do this is actually all of those, all of those ones that say DBAS, AE1, AZ1, AZ2, AZ3, they all go back to a sim link on the file system to one directory. So it's all in there. And I wanted to do this so if we actually had to switch something out, I could just replace that, I could just check out and replace that sim link with another command and say, you're unique and nothing's gonna change in here. And that, that allows me to do a test environment or isolate, a, isolate something when I'm uh, debugging. We wanna push it out in production? No, we have things pulling, but I can then isolate this one by changing out that one, uh, the root fs, uh, yeah, uh, file roots. And I can do the same thing with pillars. Um, and we try to keep it very simple and not trying to make it so difficult that this is our, like our pillar top SLS. That's, that expresses just two AZs right here. Very simple. And those are actually two files when you're actually in there. And that is a symbolic link for one AZ. So this is all in one repository. I can check it out. I can compare it between AZs. I'm not putting the logic inside the pillar to say I am in this thing and I'm matching this and I'm doing this uh, because I've had experience of, well, someone typed in the wrong thing or is trying a develop in a development environment and has pushed it into the wrong place hasn't made an if statement right, and breaks things. So instead, we push it out into separate files, and that way you're basically guaranteeing that I'm using that one. You can add other logic into, into it and make checks on your grains and other things, and particularly down in where you're getting it to match on, like I'm matching on the, glob, uh, the, the host name right there, you could change that for that particular environment. Uh, also that, you know, these are all sim linked also because those are shared between environments. So is the secrets. That secret file, uh, we keep that encrypted and then we unencrypt it and it's passed out. But I'm not, I can then, oh, yes. How do you manage all the symbolic links? That I can, I can manage with another, just another simple salt state, a salt, like a local running salt or a simple script. It's really that, that I can also have in, yeah, well, it's kind of confusing. To understand how our structure was brought up originally, all of the machines that I acquired to set up platform as a service came out of a group that provided hardware and services to us. So I, I absorbed them. They are a chef-based system. They have a little bit of infrastructure that produces uh, setting up uh, SSL certs, setting up user space, setting up um, some, you know, some of their SSH configs. And so I can leverage that to actually change that out. But there is, I have some simple scripts to do, to move that if I want to and hop the servers. But I'm, it's, this is usually, it makes it easier. Once it's done, it's set on, in the production or the development environment. It's only when you need to actually do the change, you're only doing that change on the salt master usually. So you're, you're, you're limiting who can touch it at that time. So end up with things like this. So that endpoint goes back up to the base. Does that make sense to anyone or is that a bad idea in your world? It's, it, it, symbolic link logic that is not obvious when you're reading just the SLS files. 
Ah. Okay. Well, it was in the, the, the time that I was writing this, we didn't have the include for the pillar. So we were left with the, the big problem was you can do the if, the if statements and match that. That's great if you can see what's in that if statement on one screen. When you start to get to 100 variables and multiple if state, multiple environments, we were running into a problem where, at least I am, I'm heavily dyslexic. So I was running into the problem of I've added it into this environment. Did I make sure that it came up in that environment? Did I add that, glo did I add that new uh, you know, indention? Oh, no, well, well, let me diff it. Well, I can't really diff that if statement right there. I, can't, I have to look for it. I have to go find the matching part, go down 100 lines, find the right one. Yes, it's the same. Oh, no, I changed it. Yeah, and that's what I was just going to get to. Basically, all of that looks the same. There might be something in there that's slightly different because, well, that's what I need in each environment. So getting that across all these different environments is what is the problem and trying to keep track of that. It just seems like in paradigmatic, one of the things that we presented yesterday was the map.ginger stuff. Yes, that is new to me. And that is something that I'm here for. <laughs> exactly. That is, that is one of the things that has come up that has changed what I've been talking about in the future. So that is something that I definitely say go into and figure this out. These are, these are problems that I experienced and how I went about to solve them. And I tell you, the, I'm, I'm not a wizard here. I just make it go. But I have a beard. No. And again, back down to a top SLS file. One of the things that we chose to do is instead of, you notice in here, there's nothing about MySQL in here. OpenStack requires MySQL to run. Yeah, or a database. Database, sorry. <laughs> we, you know, well, we run a Percona based Galera cluster in our setup. Putting that in, putting that in here, I could do that, but I didn't want that as part of our, our high state because we have things that we want to run as high state and never touch the database server. That is too critical to our deployment and it's too much of a unique, beautiful butterfly uh, to be screwed around with. We also do that with the RabbitMQ, which is a, another shared environment that we share with other people. And that's, that's kind of one of the critical things. We have states that bring up the correct users. We have states that bring up and add the schema to it. But we call them when we need to, and that's when we're doing the install. And that is controlled with an overstate. Running the overstate and then logically going through and saying, I need this, I depend on that, OK, next one, next one, and so forth. I don't really have to go back to, ch to make that change of uh, the database, are you installed every time? Yes, okay, thank you, good. I have other ways, if I want to keep doing packages, I'll make sure that that's part of the, my packages for updates. And these are things that, you know, reasons to leave it out of, the, out of my top file. We try to do the same thing of, uh, as like, basically like LinkedIn, try not to run the command.run. Don't bad habit, uh, fun, bad habit. Um, so instead, we have a, a system where we have to push everything into our configuration management up to Garrett, get it reviewed, and then we have a one-off um, a one-off uh, state SLS that we can, then we can push out. Uh, oh, yes, and I mentioned that installing Rabbit is an example of this, installing MySQL creating your OpenStack API points. You're probably not going to go back and try to do that every time in your database to go search, do they exist? Yes, OK, query it. And because we are doing development environments, the chances of someone screwing it up in a development environment and then 
accidentally getting it into production is what we were trying to prevent. That's some of the, the logic back here. Modifying the database, that's another, you know, we want to make sure that we're not modifying the database at any time. Create one-off states directory, I was talking about that. We use a unique name of project ticket number SLS, and then we go through that process of here's our ticket in our system, that's the SLS that we're supposed to run. Does it match up? Yep, okay. Have two eyes on it. Run the command. Yay, it did what we want. We can close the ticket. And in that SLS, we have requirements that it has, like, it's only supposed to run on this database server, or it's only supposed to run on all the database servers. It's only supposed to run once. Put that logic in there to block yourself from doing stupid stuff. You end up adding more headaches by running something twice on a database sometimes. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I locked the tables again. Oh, uh, shit. That's what we don't want to do. And grain values, and we can also store them as grain values. So you can actually have it go out, go add it to a grain. OK, now it's there. It's a grain. I can check the grain. Did we do the ticket? Yep. I can query. I can get that grain value back. Yes, that ticket has been addressed. That's handy uh, for SOX compliance, for a bunch of reasons to get that information back out and say, yeah, I can prove that we've, we've run the updates. I've created the ticket. He's marked it off. Good. Here's this. We created this SLS file. Great. It's gone through. It's created the lock file. It's added a grain. I know it's done. And that's important for HP in the, in it because they have lots of requirements of making sure that I is crossed and the T, oh geez, everything is crazy. But what features, there's like new features that are always coming out for, for salt. And there's new features coming out in OpenStack. I'm always trying to figure that out. Right now I'm stuck at 16.2 of, of salt and it's driving me nuts. And this is because I have a production environment that really, once you go into production, they don't want you to change it. Getting from what we have now and not breaking it should be easy. Should be easy. But we have to vet it all. And that's what we start asking questions and then getting on IRC. Will this, will this, will your version of like 2014.1? Uh, is that going to be compatible, backwards compatible with 16.2? Well, maybe not. Maybe it will be. I'm still figuring that out. Um, what would you do to, <coughs> to validate that it is compatible? What, what would be your test suite? My test suite? The test suite that we are working on is uh, we have two test suites that are kind of competing. Um, for validating salt states. We have one that a uh, developer is working on. He has it on GitHub, and I'll, I'll, I should get his URL. And I'll make sure it's added to the slides before I hand them over. Um, we're trying to do um, a Vagrant, using Vagrant, spinning up into Vagrant, running some tests, deploying inside Vagrant instances. So the Vagrant will bring up the whole stack. It brings up. The Nova API brings up a keystone, brings up a glance, brings up the bare minimums that we require from PaaS's, PaaS, PaaS services. I don't bring up particularly a Swift. If, if you understand what Swift is, OK, I see a bunch of nods, object store. And, uh, but I use a glance. I need to use glance to get my images to bootable. Also, because of Vagrant, we're now playing around with, because Vagrant now has uh, LXC support. So we're, do, we're playing with containers. And containers buys, buys you other things when you do what is shared packages and other things. Um, it's a lot of, there's a lot of change in there that we can work on. But validation of this right now, there's also a thing called uh, Salt Shaker, which uh, Jonathan Harker, I believe, uh, Jesus Soros, I think, is his handle, and you'll see him in the IRC chat. Mostly, he talks, he will be there most times. Um, he's working, or 
I think it might be on hold at the moment, but if you're willing to work with him, uh, he's working on a way of validating uh, salt states and via, you know, getting the ginger to compile and seeing what comes out of it. There isn't really right now a good unit testing of here's my salt state and will it run and oh god, what's the ginger output? No, you have to actually execute it on a machine, see the, see the output, even the, the test. The test will say, yeah, it kind of worked, but did I actually get what, you know, if I'm using templates, did it actually output something that is readable or did it junk it up? And that's where there's a little bit of an issue, I think, with salt right now. Um, there's a lot of, uh, HP has done a lot of work internally with uh, the chef people and have a whole chain set with a Jenkins and with their production cycle, which I'd like to see develop, developed for uh, the PaaS infrastructure is Package, uh, changes are made, they get reviewed in Garrett. Garrett sends it out for validation. Does it match syntax? Do you, do you have the proper, uh, everything in there properly syntax? Did you quote everything or do you not quote things? Well, we pick a standard and we go with it to make sure the typing gets matched correctly. Now deploy it in a, in a small environment to test that run and spin up, spin up maybe in HP's cloud, a whole virtual machine that will bring up OpenStack to our spec. Passes there, then it's good. But there should be a test before that, because that, that's expensive to do. That part right there, spinning up the, everything, could take a few minutes, could take, eh, could take an hour. If you really are trying to go and download packages and do this and you're not working on golden images and other, other things like that, or baking it with a, a disk image maker and stuff like that. So that is where I think there's, there's the possibility of salt. If we can add unit testing directly into the states of I expect this output, don't run, let me get the output, put it temporary somewhere so I can view it or validate it coming back in your state actually would show you maybe here's the output of your config file that you're, you're modified with Jinja. I know there's been a lot of work in 17 to make the return values that come back in SALT a lot better than what they were in 16. And before that, it was you know, a lot, lot less and big basically stack traces. And it's now improved a lot. Um, is there anything else anyone I, this is the part that I like. What, what do people want from me? What, what are you interested in? Is this in production now? Yes. So it will replace the chef bring system with for, for the infrastructure for PaaS as a service? Yes. That it's, uh, it's been running for a while. We have uh, two, two regions east and west, and in each region has three AZs. And do you create a new OpenStack for the environment for each tenant? No, that, that, that's, we're not doing that part. We are using this, I, I'm basically creating the OpenStack environment that platform as a service is spinning up databases for a customer. And the person that's here who actually has done a lot of interesting stuff with that is Sarab, and he's giving another talk today, I think sometime after this. And, okay. And he has a lot more, he has a lot more insight on certain things that actually happen for his world, because in their world, they're in the cloud. They've set, they spin up their own infrastructure of, of a salt master inside the PaaS cloud. And then all of that is orchestrated via APIs and other things calling into that to spin up their underlying infrastructure and working with the customer instances, actually. So customer instances are not separated out in a completely separate cloud? No. They're, they're, they are separate from the public cloud, HP's public cloud, which is... There's two versions of that. There's the newer one, uh, the 13.5 version of HP's cloud, and an older one, which is in US West. And the newer one actually has um, a different networking structure 
So you're more isolated compared to the older one where it was uh, Nova networking, and the other one is quantum. And there are two different ways of thinking about that. So going back to your initial comment about upgrading OpenStack. Yep. And what would you do to upgrade Open? Would I have to create a completely separate pass? That is the, that is the, that is the question right now. The, the upgrading from, let's say, if we were on Diablo to going to Havana, well, I would say build a whole new place and ignore this one. Upgrading from Grizzly to Havana, smoother. Smoother. Okay. Not smooth. <laughs> it, is, it is troublesome. The, you're better off creating a whole new world for people. Exactly. Yep. And yes. Uh, I am currently not uh, production in uh, the East environment is, and they have a, a larger team than I do. I was a team of one, so. This was a team of one up until about two months ago. Yeah, it's it's a. I was I was brought in to basically create an create an environment from scratch for a time when HP was growing in, growing their cloud, but had limited resources of hardware as database as a service, which was originally, that was the main thing that was ever going to be on this, this uh, private cloud. So we scaled out the machines. We want 25 disks. We want 800 gigs of RAM. We want how many cores? 32. OK, yeah, let's go. And now, well, that's great for a database. You know, RAID, RAID 10, we have good failover. We have, they're bringing up instances with uh, Galera cluster, you know, behind for the customer. But now we're having load balancing as a service come on. Load balancer, definitely a different item. And thinking about how you build your infrastructure has changed how we've deployed salt and what we need to modify to isolate things like this AZ might be just going down the path of doing LXC virtualization and we'll all be a net, uh, an aggregate group of machines for load balancers. And SALT allowed, allowed us to basically target that via grains to make sure that we're not screwing up and that our, when we push out a config, it is not getting on the wrong machine. Yeah, you can overwrite a grain, but once you have it, it's there. It's really, diff it's like, I believe there, is there, do, you, is, do people know if there's a way to delete a grain once you create it? What is, do, you, do you know how? Well, there we go. I, I, Dell? Yeah, but that's something that you have to call. And since most of the people that I'm working with are not doing that, they're just looking for it, it makes it so we are trying to really stick to a good policy of check first check again and check a third time before we actually push it out the door. We've had very, because of, because of salt, we've had very good uptime. We've been able to upgrade config files without issue. Making changes there, salt has been very handy and we know that our configuration across services and across AZ, multiple AZs, which we don't have one net, we have a huge network block that is split in three different ways. So we have, in this AZ1, I can only use this subset of IPs. In this one, it's from the same large network block, but only this subset of IPs, and so forth. So it means that we have config files that are pretty long, but that don't have any really private data. So we keep all of our secret information in secret files for those particular AZs. And we can have three different secrets files. One, a shared secret, maybe for our, what we primarily push out there is some, some certs and some keys that need to be on all the machines. 
but for endpoints, they have unique cert certs for the correct uh, load balancer endpoint. It, when the load balancer is pointing at it, it needs to have the right SSL cert for that machine. And that means that by having it in three files and not having it in one big file in an if, I can have those files encrypted separately than the one file that is for the dev environment. And I can give different people access to unencrypt that dev environment. And I have some scripts that do diffs of, GG, we use PGP or GBG uh, and diff, F, diff SLS files and only then encrypt the ones that have changed after you compared them. And that's how we keep files going around until there is a way of having salt do encrypted uh, data bags, which is uh, a name that came over from Chef. That's something that we are still looking for or wanting out of the community is a oh, way. So which point do you want the data encrypted and safe? We want the data, the, yes, this is the thing. It's we want the data encrypted and safe at the point of, I want to be able to check the whole, I want to be able to check uh, my repository of pillars into Git and have know that that stuff that is marked secret is encrypted. I pull it out. I shouldn't be, I shouldn't need to unencrypt it at that point. Salt should be able to say, oh, here's a key. It's a shared key. Maybe it's GBG. Maybe it's just um, SSL and undoes it in memory, gets it, pushes it out. Then it ends up being open. It ends up on the machine being open. It ends up being on the minion being open. You can't, you can't get away from having the file readable at some point, be it memory or be it on disk. So I'm, there's too much of uh, trying to figure out like, well, it has to be locked in here and it has to be only opened by this one machine. I can tell you a great horror story of HP as a way of doing encrypted data bags that it worked at a small scale. As it grew bigger, it doesn't quite work that well. Because you, if you're used to like GPG, you can add a new user. Like I can encrypt this file for one person. Now I can encrypt it for two people, four people, eight. Now imagine a thousand machines encrypting that one line that's this big is encrypted into a blob this long and has to be searched for based on the host. And yes, you, 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 you see the problem. So, so these, are, these are things don't do. And they're not doing, they're, they've, they've improved this. But these are previous things that we've learned. And these are things that we need to look forward in the future of SALT saying, well, how do I want to do this? Um, how many people here are actually running OpenStack today and using SALT in some function? Oh, two. Wow, three. Four? I, 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 I see behind the beard. I think it was behind the beard. What, are you, what, are you, what is your experience with it? What, are, or what have you been doing with it? Give every dev a cloud, one, okay. one button set up so that they can start debbing on it so that they can work in the environment that will eventually have to deploy to our production. Okay, and your, is your production in, in an OpenStack cloud or will be, potentially? Okay. Yeah, the, the nice thing about the keeping it all in, the, in a way that I can share, I'm trying to get the, the, the cookbooks or the recipes or the, the formulae Naming, naming, hard. Um, back to a way that I can give this back out to the public. And that's been a struggle since, for the longest time, it's been me. And now I have six other people working with me. And getting that back out to the public at, in usable cookbook form and trying to get it integrated into, into the SALT formulae area. There is already a SALT formulae for OpenStack. It does some things, and it does other things. <laughs> it does some things. Uh, 
mine, I know that mine, I, I've worked out that it works in, in our production world, but it needs some loving care. And me going through going, oh, I don't need to use a context anymore to get variables in here. OK. Oh, I can use uh, pillar get. OK, change that to pillar get. Well, now it's, OK, let's change this to map gingers. OK, and that, that cycle of changing and keeping up to date is something that I'm trying to, by having more people working on the team, to get in the habit of, we're going to push this here. Eventually, I want to take the cookbooks that I'm running right now in production and not point at my local Git repository and point to repository outside and know that I'm working with the community and getting the features that they want and what I should be also wanting. Because I need to be running the latest also. Yep. It seems like, at least in, in my attempts to get OpenStack up and running, the only way to get OpenStack up and running is through the heroic efforts of a few individuals. And it doesn't sound like Salt has helped you in any way to get that outside of the heroic effort. The heroic effort is the heroic effort that is the nightmare of salt documentation is that the salt docs for the longest time, and they're getting better, but they still suck or are damaging because if you go through the salt, or no, go through Chef, or no, ah, words. If you go through OpenStack and you try to install it via what the document says, you run into all types of problems. You go through and you're like, oh, it's expecting a user here. Well, I never created the user yet. Yeah, I'm sorry, OpenStack, yeah. I'm, I'm, words, words. I also, have a, I also have a very interesting stutter where I substitute words that I can't get out of my mouth with words that are close. And they're very close right now. Um, Fun fact, the, the OpenStack docs are maintained by one lady. We had the privilege of learning that from our trainer from Rackspace. And so the yes. reason they get out of date is he and she are working on them sort of out of sync as he fixes them. And then she puts those yeah. in. And that's why they get sort of, oh, it looks like one person did this part. And a moron did this part. There's more people. But the, the reason to use the, the states right now is that they have configs that should have sane defaults now in the sense that if there is a variable there in the, in the salt config, I've tried to set it up so every part of that can be, or for Nova's, for Nova's configuration, let's say, say example, every part that is a configurable option has uh, get pillar salt da, 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 get this and fill it in or go with the default. So you can have a very thin pillar if you're just going with the defaults, and that makes it that should make it a lot simpler for people to onboard and try out using salt to spin up OpenStack. And then it's where it becomes unique. Like you in my in my particular Nova config, we have a unique thing called. Uh, you know, our service tenant. We've extended uh, the um, Nova scheduler, I think, uh, to make sure that our database, we can get the right IP address into the right AZ, because they deprecated a piece of code in uh, Nova networking when, um, they went to, when, the, when they went to quantum networking. And, that screwed us pretty heavily because we have three different AZs that can't share a network. So you're bringing up a VM with an IP address for only to be used in AZ3 and AZ1. Well, the machine's up, yay, can't get to it. What's wrong with this? Well, the IP's over here publicly and not a route. Things like that. And by doing that, then that's a customization that can happen right into the Nova config in a, in a template form with an if statement saying, are you in this environment? Are you in this grain? Are, are, is this grain set? Yes. Also, if that's true, go with, if it's not set, go with a, a default that doesn't matter. Because if it's, because we found out like certain variables, if we start putting things in, in uh, OpenStack and put in the, a variable that you think, oh, that should be safe. Well, it might actually use that for something 
and you find out later that, well, that's why you're not talking to your machines this time. OpenStack is uh, a very large beast to uh, configure, but once you get it configured, that's the, the hurler, that, that effort. Once that effort is done, it's easier to pass around. And no one has really made it very easy yet. Uh, the chef people were working on that, and I was working with them at one point, trying to get their cookbooks to have a good way of deploying that. And that's some of the reasons why I started playing with uh, the salt stuff, was because different directions and different ideas and how much that, at one point, Chef was going down the, the path of, well, we're going to manage the upgrade, and we're going to do all this, and we're going to make it all work and throughout the whole stack. And that's such a large picture. But OpenStack is, is unique for each environment. The way I have it set up, I use a Bond Zero with virtual interfaces on VLANs, and you might have actual two physical interfaces. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you have one interface, but you don't need VLANs. You want to just do it with a tap device. OK, you're only doing a test environment. All of that needs to be configured. And managing all of those changes in one big cookbook is asking for disaster, especially if it's one that's going to get run every time. And that's what they, they were trying to push it all together at one point. I think that's changed. I could be wrong. And this was a, a year or two ago. So don't, don't quote me on this, but I don't know anymore since I've now been playing with salt. And you'd be using salt going board? Yes. Uh, we're looking at, we are playing around with Ansible because we have one guy who just seems to love Ansible. And then again, I turn around and go, well, I don't want to give people SSH access to boxes. We don't want to have people logging in and modifying boxes remotely. And at least at the time when I was looking at Ansible the first time, was Ansible worked over SSH. Came in with a key, came in in that user, did its thing, left. So that's why that went on the back burner. We want to basically do, you know, you know, in some ways the server reliability type model of it happens here, we control it, it goes out, does its thing, but try to keep hands off. If you, need to, if you need to go and get logic and pull things out of it, you create a new state file, a new singular one-off that goes and says, I'm going to query this and get information back for that machine. And usually the turnaround time for that is pretty quick during the day. If it happens at night, you might, well, well you might have to wait. But we have people that are on my team now that are in Ireland and potentially another person coming up in another country. So having that ability to keep them, even though you're going into a change management system and checking on it with Garrett and having it come out, you still get a pretty good turnaround of, I got two, I got two people to look on a, on a change before we actually push it into production. And HP is wonderful and also crazy in other ways. So we have a production area, and I'm still waiting on certain areas for a test environment in certain places. And that's, that's the life of working at a large company. There's politics. And we are lucky that the politics that, that are currently is I get, to, I get to use salt. And some other teams are using salt. There's people in the networking team using salt. There's talks about people trying out uh, managing switches and gear using salt and things like that. And those are powerful things that we will come in the future because right now, how many people really have good management ways of managing your switches, managing your networks? We get into the world of quantum OpenStack's network, you know, you know virtual net, uh, software-defined networks. That's going to either happen in software on, a, on your Linux box or actually happen on that switch by talking an API. If it talks an API, we should have ways of doing that via salt, too, or whatever's out there. And that's, I think I'm done. Um, and I hope, I hope you got something out of it. If not, please tell me. Uh, please fill out the survey and let me know what I should add, what I should redact. Uh,
but I really like the conversation of trying to get from what people have here and get their ideas. And that's what I think we can get with, uh, with SALT and with most OpenStack or open source projects is the community of finding out what is your niche and how do you itch it? And is it contagious? <laughs> so this is the work you've done so far? Yeah. Th this is what I'm working off of. Uh, this is the, this is, this is the formula is what I'm trying to get production to go to. It's very rough right now. And it's, so, but that's what I'm working on. Look at for, look at formula first. There's there's definitely bugs. It probably won't run out of the box, but it is where I'm heading, and that's the one where I'm going to be adding uh, uh, Jinja maps and other things to actually try to simplify this uh, process and make it more logical and have better better uh, dependencies because there are dependencies like there are dependencies for HA proxy in my setup, dependencies for memcache. But should I be writing a whole HA proxy for setting up OpenStack? No, I should leverage the community one and then extend it. I haven't done that yet, but I need to do that. I know where these parts that need to be changed have to happen, and how do you extend it so this particular, it's like an organism, it needs to live with these, with these parts. Commented or, or yeah, yeah, that's it's start it's starting. It's down in the dependency area of the of that. And if you, if you don't see it, the the issue tracker is there. The wiki page add stuff. Log into GitHub. Bug the hell out of me, because I like that. It's better than what I'm doing right now, in some ways. Okay. Well, thank you.